say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt I really right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I had figured it, out. I it was that wrong. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. We have shows coming up in New York City, a special event March 3rd with Springer, and March 18th is our annual Brain Awareness Week show. For more, take a look at storycollider.org. This week's story is from Indre Viscontis. It was recorded in October 2014 at the Rickshaw Stop in San Francisco. So about halfway through graduate school, I was sitting in my office one day, and I was staring at the wall, as I spent a lot of time in grad school doing, uh, not thinking about what I should have been thinking, which was my dissertation, um, but wondering why I was still single. You know, I was in my mid-20s. Uh, I wasn't, like, terrible to look at. I was ambitious, and I'd gotten into a top-five neuroscience program, so I wasn't, you know, a total dumbass. And... Uh, and I looked around to my office, and there are two other graduate students with me. They're both, like, beautiful, smart women. And we were all single. And so I thought, okay, this is a problem we need to solve, and it's going to be a lot easier to solve than the MATLAB coding bug that I'm currently working on. So I turned to them, and I said, ladies, why are we still single? Let's figure this out. We put our heads together. We thought about it for a while. And we decided, well, it wasn't because there was a lack of opportunity, because we were at UCLA, uh, we were in Los Angeles, a big city, it's a big university, we were in a male-dominated field. So it's not like there weren't prospects out there. So the only other answer, of course, was that our standards were too high. So how do you lower your standards uh, when, you know, you're an ambitious woman and, you know, this is, this is something that's important to you. It's a sort of big part of your life. Um, so we decided we need to throw science at the problem. So we turned to the chalkboard in our office, which at the time was, you know, filled with little graphs and doodles that we had and kind of, you know, tricks on how to do pivot tables in Excel. And uh, we erased all of that because clearly that wasn't getting us anywhere. Um, and instead, we replaced it with what we affectionately termed the man chart. Mm -hmm. And the man chart was really a way of organizing our dating life uh, such that we can always be dating somebody. Uh, since, since our standards were too high, what we needed to do was take the entire pool of eligible bachelors that we knew, um, put them into a rating system, develop an algorithm to figure out who should be on top, and then always be dating the top three, right? <laughs> totally made sense to us. So we started out by having a column where we put all the men that we knew that were eligible, uh, and then each of us would get a list of variables that would go into our own personal algorithm. So for example, in my algorithm, it was really important to me that the guy be kind, um, that he be smart, that he have a sense of humor, uh, that he do things you know, outside of just whatever it is he does for money, um, and that you know, he be cute. So those were all my variables. And then what we would do to develop the algorithm is weight the variables as to how important they are to you. So for example, in my case, um, it was more important for me that the guy be kind than that he be good looking. So I would, you know, weight kindness like times two and good looking maybe 1.5. Um, and then the the variables that were not that important to me would have like a 0.5 or a 0.25 rating. Um, and then finally, there were things that you could, you could use a not function for, right? So um, he definitely should not be, say, for example, a surfer dude. You know, that was important to me. I was in LA. So, uh, you know, that would be a negative. So like if he was really high on everything else, but he was a surfer dude, like he still could be up high on the man chart. So that solves the problem of you being too picky and, you know, always never, never getting on an actual date because of what you've created is an impossible human being. Now remember that we always had to have someone at the top of the man chart. There were always people that would fit into the algorithm. But the beautiful thing about this man chart was that if someone better came along, 
well, he'd just toss out number one, and now you, you know, you were not losing. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not sacrificing um, that particular characteristic, and yet, you know, you're still always going on dates. So we were also familiar with Newton's laws of motion, and that, um, especially that an object at rest stays at rest unless there's a force that acts upon it. So we decided we needed to create some forces for ourselves, otherwise we would just continue sitting in our office developing even better algorithms for the man chart instead of actually going out and talking to any men. Uh, so we each developed a series of goals for each of us. So, and, and the trick here was that you had to develop goals for the other person um, so as opposed to you developing them for yourself because you know, you'd probably create either unreachable goals or totally stupid goals. So the, the goals that my uh, colleagues created for me were that I had to go on three dates within the next six weeks. So to them, they thought that was totally approachable, and to me, it was totally daunting. I hadn't been on a date in like a year, and to do three in six weeks seemed impossible. But you know, I thought, okay, you know, we, we've done this. I'm going to do my best uh, to follow up and meet these goals. Around the same time, uh, we had started having regular lab meetings, and we went to a lab meeting one day, and my advisor told us about this memory meeting. I studied memory uh, down in Irvine, so it's about an hour south of L.A., and she said, uh, we, you go to this memory meeting, and a bunch of professors give some talks, but then all the grad students and postdocs give a five-minute talk as part of what's called the data blitz. Now, the data blitz was, you know, kind of cool because you could win a prize. Um, so I was competitive and it, prizes were fun for me. And the prize was that you could win a $100 uh, gift certificate to Barnes & Noble. Remember they used to have bookstores? <laughs> um, and I was a poor grad student and I loved books. So 100 bucks seemed like a lot of money and seemed awesome. Um, but you also got your name etched onto a brick uh, and then put into a little pathway to the psych building in Irvine uh, on, on a little path called Memory Lane. Um, it was very clever. So it was like a bunch of donors and then all the Data Blitz winners who had bricks on memory lane. So I thought, well, you know, I, I didn't really like doing things that weren't either related to my work at UCLA or opera singing or, you know, like rollerblading on the beach. Um, so I didn't really want to go to the memory meeting, but I thought, well, you know, I should go. And my advisor said, you know, Indre, you are a shoe in for the Data Blitz Prize because you're a performer. You like being on stage. You like being the, being the center of attention. Um, and also, you have some really cool data. Um, at the time, I was recording from the hippocampus and patients with epilepsy and getting single unit data, so from individual neurons, which is the only place in the world where we could actually do this. And I had some kind of cool results. So she's like, You're totally going to win this if you go. So I thought, OK. So, I thought, well, that's worth the drive down to Irvine, and maybe I'll meet some new people and, you know, put them on the man chart. <laughs> so down I drive to Irvine, and memory meetings going along, and, you know, it's as expected. Most of the other data blitzers are really shy, and they're presenting, you know, kind of predictable results. And, you know, I get up and do my talk, and, like, I totally rock it. So it was awesome. Super fun. And, uh, <laughs> and then I sit down, and I'm feeling like, yeah thinking about all the books I'm going to buy at Barnes and & Noble. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it was like the lights dimmed, and this like really handsome young man uh, put up what was the most beautiful PowerPoint slide I'd ever seen. Um, he had drawn, hand-drawn the entire nervous system of Aplesia Californica. And if you know what the nervous system of Aplesia Californica looks like, um, you know what I mean. But if you don't, it basically looks like a penis. Um, but anyway, it was beautiful. It was a beautifully drawn slide. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to kill me. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a beautifully drawn slide, and not only did he put up this great slide, but he also stepped out in front of the podium and told the most amazing story. Like, all the rest of us were, you know, hov hovering behind the podium with our notes, etc. He stepped out, told this great story, and I just watched my certificate evaporate in front of my eyes. And I thought, well, if I lost the data blitz, at least I can get a date out of this, right? Because he's just like shot up high on the man chart. So uh, out, out comes lunchtime, and you know we had these little dots on our name tags that with a color. Where and then there was a balloon with that color, and you had to sit at the table with the balloon. And he wasn't at my table with my balloon either. So I thought, well, this is just a really shitty day. Uh, but at some point, he walked over, and he introduced himself, and he said, you know, I really liked your talk. And I was like, wow, I really liked your talk. 
and uh, you know my mind's kind of blowing. And um, and and later on, I found out that he actually didn't really remember my talk. Um, but one of his friends had come up to him and said, "You know, you got to meet this woman, Indre. Like she scares the shit out of me, but you'll love her." <laughs> Um, so anyway, we had a conversation, and the conversation started to get onto the topic of opera. And he said, you know, um, I remember this one time when I saw Sam Raimi in Carlisle Floyd's Susanna at the Met. Um, now, for a person who's an opera fan, this just is, like, amazing, right? Because most people, first of all, have never heard of an opera by an American composer. They've never been to the Met, which is, like, you know, the mecca of opera. They certainly don't go to a dress rehearsal unless you're, like, a big donor or you know somebody. And they don't remember the names of the actual singers, right? So I'm like, this guy is a super opera fan. And he's, you know, cute. And he's smart. And, like, this is just going off the man chart. And... Uh, and so I thought, okay, I really need to get a date with this guy. And, you know, then he sort of you know, turns to me and he says, you know, I, I have a friend who's directing a play in Long Beach, halfway between L.A. and Irvine. Um, would you like to go with me? And I was just like, would I ever? Check and check. Uh, so a couple days later, we met up at the play, and he bought my ticket, and we sat next to each other, of course, and he had these really cool boots on. Uh, and I <laughs> could feel the chemistry. He was a little tense in the air. And after the play, um, you know, we went and had a gin and tonic in the bar around the corner. And I thought, this is going so well. This is awesome. And then he says, well, you know, i got to get up in the morning, so um, I'll walk you to your car. I was like, okay. Uh, so he walks me to my car, and I'm thinking, well, I would have had another gin and tonic, even though I have to drive. But, you know, two is okay over the course of four hours, right? But whatever, uh, and uh, and he extends his hand to shake my hand, and I'm devastated. I'm like, what did I do? Like this guy's shaking my hand and basically telling me that now that he's graduated, he had just graduated it was his last year, he's going to go off to New York on a you know cross the country road trip, and I'm like okay, I clearly did something wrong. So I was really sad, and I got into my car, and I was driving back up to L.A., and my phone rings, and it's him. And he's like, um, you know, apropos of our earlier conversation, I was wondering if you might um, want to go see Don Giovanni at LA Opera with me before I leave. And I was like, yeah, date number two. That's so awesome. So... Um, then the next year, he was off doing his postdoc at Stanford, and I was back at the Data Blitz. And without him in the competition, I won the Data Blitz. <laughs> uh, and now in the room uh, just outside where our precocious nine-month-old son sleeps, there are two cheap $1 certificates each with the prize of the Data Blitz. And down in Irvine on Memory Lane, there are two bricks with our names on it. So the man chart totally worked. <laughs> That was Indre Viscontis. Indre is a neuroscientist, opera singer, and host of the Inquiring Minds podcast. Find them online at motherjones.com slash inquiringminds. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Additional from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio, the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Rickshaw Stop for hosting the show, to Kishore Hari and everyone at the Bay Area Science Festival for being amazing partners, and to Semi-Arbitrary Lists for creating serendipity. Thanks for listening. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill.